Hi everyone, Laszlo here. Before we get started with today's episode, I'm excited to announce the launch of my new audio course series, The History of Chinese Philosophy. If you've ever been curious about Chinese philosophy and want to develop a comprehensive understanding or be able to explain to your family or colleagues the differences between Confucianism and Taoism, or what's in the Book of Changes, one of the most widely published books in the world, this is the course for you. If you'd like to take advantage of an early bird discount for a limited time only, I invite you to go to avid.fm slash Laszlo. I'll have this link in the show notes. My thanks to all of you, and I hope you'll enjoy these courses, as well as other great audio learning courses, at avid.fm. That's A-V-I-D dot F-M. And now, on to the episode. Hi right, everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here, the Tea History Podcast, close relative of the China History Podcast. Go uh, check that show out if you're into that sort of thing. It's called one of the best podcast shows out there in the China history space, in the top five. We're continuing on with our story, getting to the end, thanks to the services of Mr. Robert Fortune and many others. By the late 1800s, after tea plantations sprouted up all over northern India and Sri Lanka, tea planting then spread fast to Russia, Turkey, Kenya, and other parts of Africa and Asia. After the secret became common knowledge, almost any country with the climate and geography entered the tea-growing business. In 2021, there are at least 48 countries in the world producing tea now. And as I said in the first episode, three billion cuppas a day, tea is the third most consumed substance on Earth after air and water. But its penetration to almost every country on Earth only happened in the 20th century. You know, I haven't even spoken about poor tea. I receive no small amount of concerned emails from listeners asking me, what kind of tea history podcast is this? 18 episodes in and scant mention of poor. And when in the heck am I going to get around to talking about this? The king of teas, the tea most appreciated by true experts, aficionados, and charen in all shapes and sizes. Puar is not just a category of tea. It's also a place. Well, it's now a prefecture-level city, a DG Shir, located in southern Yunnan province, about two hours north of Xishuangbanna and five hours south of Kunming, Xishuangbanna is a city south of Puar. I guess people like to call that area of Yunnan the center of the epicenter, as far as where Puar tea was first grown and made. It's not a terribly Chinese-sounding name, Xishuangbanna. The Chamagu Dao, the Tea Horse Road, began in the south part of Xishuangbanna in a place called Iwu, not to be confused with Yiwu in central Zhejiang province, center of the merchandise wholesale trade in China. Puar's name, don't ask me why, was changed to Simao right after liberation in 1949. But ever since 2007, after Puar tea had become such a global sensation, they decided to change it back to the original name. The market in Puar tea promptly crashed soon afterwards, but we'll get to that. What's interesting about Puar, the city, is that it borders three countries, Laos, Vietnam, and Burma. The Shan state of Burma, so you know which famous triangle Puar is located in. They get about 59 inches of rain there a year, so you know that slice of Yunnan is wet, humid, with lots of sunshine, and carpeted with mountains and valleys. Perfect tea-growing conditions. No wonder the epicenter of all the indigenous tea trees in the world is located in this province. The tea that comes out of this region of southern Yunnan is so special that its own category had to be created just for it. In Cantonese, they call this tea bole. I mentioned in a previous episode about Yixing where, well, Puar is the tea that goes hand in hand with that tea ware from Jiangsu province. Why are some tea people so in love with Puar? I have to say, among Chinese teas, it has a taste all its own. It's very distinct and has been described as earthy, musty, and very natural tasting. But I've met tea people who are simply reverent about Puar tea. 
All teas are unique in their own ways, but Pu'er, how can I explain the way this tea stands out? The way it's processed, and also in the terroir, and special handling involved in the processing and storage. This is what makes Pu'er tea so special. You could make green tea almost anywhere in southern and central China. Same with almost any tea, I guess, but not Pu'er. No, not unless it's Yunnan Da Ye, big leaf tea, grown, processed, sun dried in the time worn fashion of the locals, and packed in this region of southern Yunnan. Can you call it Pu'er Cha? There's no such thing as Fujian Pu'er or Hangzhou Pu'er. Another unique thing about Pu'er tea is that, like red wine, this tea is considered better the older it gets. Now, this isn't necessarily true in all cases, of course, but an aged cake of Pu'er is considered something special that you might enjoy 10, 20, or 30 years from now, or maybe pass it down to the next generation, or as it sometimes happens, sell it at auction. And because some of this tea is so expensive, there's a big market in fakes. Eh, It's like this for all top-priced teas, not just Pu'er's. There's quite a brisk business in these counterfeit Shanjai teas. Another interesting thing about Pu'er is that, although you can buy it in loose leaf form, its most characteristic type of packaging by far are these round, disc-like tea cakes and other shapes that were designed centuries ago specifically for ease in packing and transport. The most well-known of these traditional ways to package Pu'er teas was in these discs, a few different sizes. and They're shaped just like a discus, and seven of these discs would be stacked in a bamboo wrapper of sorts, and these became known as Qi Zi Bing Cha, or Seven Suns Tea Cake. You always see those characters on the wrapper of most of these Pu'er disc-shaped tea cakes, and you could buy them individually. I have a couple dozen in my collection, and I didn't purchase a single one. They were all gifts from my Chinese friends and colleagues. Pu'er tea cakes are very popular gifts. There's this old tradition in Chinese culture, and in other cultures as well, where when you visit an old friend or someone you're maybe meeting for the first time, you bring a small gift. Nothing too fancy. And in Chinese, you call this a jianmian li. Jianmian means to meet or see each other, and a li is a gift. Remember, in an earlier episode, we discussed the Cha Ma Gu Dao, the ancient tea horse road. Well, they'd load up on these tea bricks in Yunnan and Sichuan, and to the west and to the north, the tea would be transported. The minority ethnic people down there loaded up their wagons with the tea picked from these ancient trees with their da ye zi, or big leaves, and supplied these regions beyond China's borders. All the tea grown by these ethnic minority people in the nooks and crannies of the mountains around there would be taken to the central market of Pu'er City. And there, in Pu'er City, the tea farmers and merchants would gather to start the ball rolling as far as getting the product out to the markets in Tibet, Mongolia, and elsewhere. The tea makers scattered among the many mountains of Yunnan all make similar product, but each brand of Pu'er has its own particular tudian, or something about it that experts are most enamored by. But this tea, well, it wasn't Pu'er tea yet. It was just dried and compressed tea leaves. Pu'er tea, as we know it, wouldn't make its debut until the Ming Dynasty. Speaking in the most general terms possible, there are two types of Pu'er tea, Sheng Pu'er and Shou Pu'er. Sheng means raw and Shou means ripe. There's two ways to make ripe Pu'er tea. You can either do it the old-fashioned way and let it age, or there was a processing method that only came in the 1970s that accelerates the ripening process. You see, this shows, even into our modern times, tea still hadn't yet revealed all its secrets. The longer you age the Pu'er in storage, the better tasting and more mellow it becomes, and usually more expensive, too. With ripe Pu'er tea, the green raw Pu'er's aging process is accelerated by this special process that spares you the 30-year wait for that raw Pu'er to reach its optimum taste. 
This special process is called wo dui. Wo means to wet or to moisten, and dui means a heap or a pile. This is a process where the raw leaves are fooled into believing they are being aged slowly, but in fact, it all happens rather quickly, and what you ultimately get is a pu'er tea that is fully oxidized, microbiologically fermented, and tasting quite old and venerable already. So you could obtain pu'er tea as an already ripened, ready-to-drink show pu'er, or you can enjoy the raw or green pu'er, which has other characteristics to it which can be no less enjoyable, though most pu'er people might not agree. There's so many interesting things about pu'er tea. Where it's made and who is making it is also quite fascinating. As I mentioned, it's mostly all made down in Yunnan province. And last I checked, there are 26 different ethnic minority people down in Yunnan, and a lot of them are involved in the Pu'er tea business. The mass of Pu'er tea comes from bushes planted in great tea gardens, but some come from trees that are relatively young, that is, one to two hundred years old. The more expensive and coveted Pu'er teas come from the older tea trees, many of them growing wild in the mountains of southern Yunnan. The trees only grow on the mountainsides. The older the tree, the more intense the taste. There's a type of Pu'er that's particularly prized, and giving it as a gift to someone is quite special. These are the leaves that are picked from a Gu Shu, or an ancient tree. In Chinese... Pu'er tea is also referred to as hei cha, or black tea. It is the darkest liquor of most all teas. For ripe and raw pu'er, sheng pu'er and shou pu'er, they both start from the same leaf. Our Western nomenclature for black tea, like Lipton, for example, in the Chinese reckoning, would actually be called hong cha, or red tea. So let's take a look at how they make pu'er tea. After the tea pickers, these cai cha nyu, after they've done their job, the front end work is similar to any number of green teas. First, they are heaped into piles where a bacterial culture is added. Then it starts to do its thing. There's a lot of microbial activity involved in the production of pu'er. The next thing done is to kill those dang enzymes that immediately start working on the plucked leaf the minute it hits the cai cha nyu's tea basket. That's the Sha Qing part. Remember, Sha means to kill, and Qing means green. Big woks are used to pan fry the leaves and immediately, partially but not totally, deactivate the enzymes. The next stop is to roll those leaves. This is the Ronian part. This step is where the great masters who make all this artisanal handmade tea, that's how they do that thing that they do, pounding, twisting, and doing these other secret techniques that only they know about. And this adds their little touch to their village's brand of pu'er. The leaves are not rolled too aggressively or for long. The tea masters have their way of knowing how long to work those leaves. They know how to adjust everything, the temperature and humidity, and everything else that goes into the precise outcome of every individual tea flavor profile. No ovens or mechanical shortcuts are involved in making real pu'er tea. Real pu'er tea has to be sun-dried after rolling. Under the Yunnan sun it must go for further fermentation of the leaves to take place. Some places will allow them to dry in a special temperature and humidity-controlled room with just enough moisture to continue to allow for oxidation. And this can take as long as 40 days. Once this front-end processing is all taken care of, the end result is raw pu'er, or mao cha. Mao, well, aside from being the same character mao as in Chairman Mao, here it means something else. It means semi-finished, I presume, guessing from the multitude of different meanings for the character mao. Mao cha, well, this is sort of like a stem cell. It could go either way, depending on what you wish to do with it. This mao cha is very similar looking to green tea. If you want to make sheng pu'er, raw pu'er, from this point you steam the mao cha, mold it, 
and wrap it up in any number of package forms. And once this is done, the product is called semi-fermented at this point. The remainder of the fermentation process will occur in the package over time, providing you keep the cake of Pular stored properly. I'm not going to get into the chemical details, but while you have it stored away in a cool, dark place, there's a whole microbiology lesson going on inside that pool RT. Any bacteriologists or mycologists out there wondering, the two chief culprits involved in the process are Aspergillus and Penicillium, species pluralists, I might add. They're the predominant microbes working their magic. And if you just kick back and wait 15 or 20 years, you'll have some nice, mature Pu'ar tea. But if you want the ripe Pu'ar, the stuff that tastes like it's been kept in a safe place for a nice long stint, well, more has to be done to get it ready for the Wadwe process that acts like a time machine, bringing this Pu'ar tea to a future state of maturity. Also, I may not have clearly explained the differences that exist between the ripe Shu Pu'ar tea age naturally over decades, and the ripe Pu'ar tea that used the Wadwe process developed in Yunnan. This process, developed in the 1970s, lit a fire under the aging process and speeded things up. And I just wanted to mention that amongst the cognoscenti who know their Pu'ar, there's a world of difference. This secret process was discovered at the Kunming Cha Chang, the Kunming Tea Factory, back when bell-bottoms were just beginning to go out of style. This process expedites the fermentation of the natural molds in the tea and turns the tea leaves black. A drying process follows where yeast and mold on the leaves continues to ferment. Mold actually appears on the leaf. You really have to get it right making ripe Pu'ar tea. Otherwise, you could end up with some pretty foul-smelling and rancid-tasting stuff. After the fermented and post-fermented leaves are completely dried, workers will sift through the whole pile and take all the good, full, unbroken leaves and put those aside. That is the primo stuff. From that point on, it's two more steps. You sterilize everything and either sell it as is, loose leaf product, or the final step is to compress it into any number of traditional shapes. The round bing cha discs are perhaps the most common, as well as the bird's nest shaped tuo cha. Most of the pu'ar tea I've seen is wrapped in a kind of paper that lists all the vital info of where it came from, the weight, when it was packed, and the brand. If the tea is one of those high-value ones that have been sold, auctioned, or passed on, the provenance is also shown on the wrapper. And there's a system they have to authenticate all this. Collectors in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia caused the prices of Pu'ar tea to skyrocket in the lead-up to the Beijing Olympics when money was loose and there was a lot of it sloshing around the system. And corruption back then was still sort of okay. Prices for the best Pu'ars were out of sight. But in 2008, the market crashed. And the good folks down in Yunnan, who were riding the crest of the Pu'ar wave, they had to take a few gulps of Xi Feng, that northwest wind. That's an old saying. He Xi Feng. So wretched and unpleasant are the winds coming off the Gobi and across Xinjiang, that to say you really got it rough, one might say they're drinking the northwest winds. Anyway, Pu'ar tea, like white, green, and oolong teas, has become popular in the world of health products. Pu'ar and white teas, the two diametric opposites of the tea category spectrum, are these days touted as particularly healthy to drink. Mind you, the health products industry is not regulated, so a lot of these claims that are made regarding the efficacy of these teas and tea extracts don't have anything like the FDA to keep them honest. And we all have to just sort of take their word for it or do our own due diligence Pu'ar tea has vitamins B1, B2, C, and E, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, lysine, arginine, histidine, cysteine, and trace amounts of zinc, sodium, nickel, iron, beryllium, sulfur, and fluorides. Hey, who needs vitamins? Practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine say Pu'ar 
opens up the meridians and warms the middle burner inside you, namely your stomach and spleen. TCM researchers also maintain that poor tea facilitates mental alertness and fights high cholesterol, obesity, and diabetes, as well as containing the same antioxidants found in other teas that, through its blood-cleansing properties, protects the heart and coronary system. The claims made by some scientists, or marketing people, not sure, regarding poor tea's effectiveness as a weight loss aid, well, the jury is still out on that. And all the reports that I've skimmed through on the Google, well, they were just carried out with animals, not humans. Not that we're not mammals ourselves, but just saying. But unlike other teas, it's said that ripe, but not raw poor tea, in particular contains lovastatin something available only as a prescription drug used in slowing the production of cholesterol in your body. The riper the puar, the more lovastatin. And more than any other tea, puar is also considered the best digestive aid, especially after a nice, heavy meal that may or may not be high in oils and fats. This may or may not come from the healthy probiotics you ingest that come about from the fermentation process. It said puar is the perfect tea to cap off a nice dim sum meal. And though I myself, not being much of an imbiber of alcohol, can't claim this, but many say that puar tea is also a curative for hangovers. Claims and research abound regarding puar's efficacy in breaking down fats and lowering LDL bad cholesterol, as well as in the treatment of arterial sclerosis, colds, bleeding, and hepatitis. And the high level of vitamin C can be rapidly taken in by the body. Besides lowering fat and cholesterol, Puar tea is also touted as effective in treating and preventing cancer. Hard to say at this point, though. There's way more to it than what I'm telling you, and the varieties of Puar tea go way beyond the ripe and raw leaves that I've mentioned. If you drill down a little deeper, you'll find it's very complex. And if you find it's not your cup of tea, eh, keep trying. Search for any reputable-looking online tea shop, and you'll see dozens of different kinds of poor teas. Loose, in cake form, baby tips, raw, ripe, mixtures of raw and ripe, and a myriad of brands and ages. There are so many YouTube videos showing how to prepare puar and how to enjoy it to the max. There are videos of the most respected tea masters showing you how to do it upright every step of the way. Poor tea. That might have a bit of an acquired taste. You never know. You might like it on the first try. If you've never had it before, I hope this briefest of introductions gives you an idea about what it is and why real tea people who love Chinese tea wake up and go to sleep every night with this stuff. You'll see some online tea stores only deal in puar and nothing else. I can only say, if you never tried it before, give it a shot. And as I mentioned uh, previously, if you should find puar to your liking and want to make this your go-to tea for everyday use, make sure to invest in an Yixing teapot, which is really the best way to cuddle up to puar tea. As I mentioned in that episode, these special teapots are perfect for this kind of tea. And the more you use them, the more the porous clay of the Yixingware becomes seasoned by the brew and over time becomes one with the puar tea flavor. And as I mentioned, don't mix teas with your Yixing teapot. Keep it only for your puar. That's what this kind of teaware was developed for. You'll see in all these tea videos showing you the delights of puar tea. In every one, these masters and tea experts always use these Yixing teapots and deliver to you free of charge everything and anything you need to know. How to prepare the tea, how to take care of your Yixing teapot, how to store your puar, and just plain old how to enjoy the whole experience. And with puar tea, you could get five, six, seven, and even more pours per serving. And some insist the puar tea flavor reaches its optimal level after a certain number of pours. Everyone is different as far as what pleases them most, and you could find out for yourself that perfect sweet spot when you're kicking back and enjoying puar yourself or with your friends or loved ones. 
I've only given you the briefest of thumbnail overviews of what Pu'er tea is all about. Next episode, we'll look at several more teas and some of the history and legends surrounding them. I'll try not to overwhelm you with all the different choices you have out there. It really is that. It's overwhelming. But it's a good overwhelming, so that's for next time. Until that time, my fine friends all over the world, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles in the Golden State, wishing you all the best and giving you my highest recommendations to come back next time for another ambrosial episode of the Tea History Podcast. Podcast.